Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about The Juggernaut, a subscription publisher aimed at servicing the South Asian community in the U.S. Snigda Sir's first idea for a media startup was a kind of Netflix for Bollywood streaming service, but when she spoke to investors about the idea, they all pointed out that it'd be too easy for Netflix to simply copy her strategy. Though she quickly scrapped that idea, she still wanted to launch some sort of outlet that would service South Asian Americans, a group that she felt was underrepresented in mainstream media. This led to the launch of a free weekly newsletter that amassed several hundred readers. That free newsletter eventually evolved into The Juggernaut, a subscription-funded publisher that has a dedicated and growing fan base. I interviewed Snigda about how she convinced Y Combinator to let in a media startup, why she launched a hard paywall, and whether she'll ever introduce advertising into her revenue mix. Before we jump into the interview, I want to point out that this podcast doesn't have any advertising either. That's because I'm 100% dependent on paid subscriptions to fund all the work that I do here. If you get value from this podcast and it helps you in your career, please consider subscribing. Doing so will get you premium newsletters delivered to your inbox every week. Go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Snigda. Hey, Snigda, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. So you founded The Juggernaut. Uh, Talk about what you were doing prior to that. Like you had a little bit of journalism experience, I think, in high school and college, but you had never officially worked in journalism. What what was your bat? What, what, What kind of experience did you have in journalism before then? Yes. Um, I had run my high school newspaper. It was called The Stuyvesant Spectator. To this day, we still meet up and some of those folks are my closest friends. And that experience was just really intense, to be frank, because I don't know if you know much about Stuyvesant High School, but we took ourselves really, really seriously. And so we came out with both a print and a digital paper every two weeks. We considered ourselves financially independent from the school. So we were funded and had this business kind of section and a publishing section where they would uh, be responsible for getting ads to kind of support the journalism. And then we had a 10th period journalism class where we would get to speak to incredible journalists from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, et cetera. And they would co-teach the class with us. And that's kind of how I met a ton of amazing people from Jenny Lee to Adam Pennington. Um, as a very young, very young kid. I also did a summer journalism session, I believe with CUNY, um, where I got to work with this woman named Betty Lou, and it was our job to write one story by the end of that summer. So I believe I did that as well. And then by the time I got to college, I was writing and photographing for every single desk you can imagine, except for the opinion section at the Yale Daily News. So I was writing for uh-huh. news, I was writing for features, I was writing for the culture desk, I got to review cheese at this cheese store in New Haven. I also got to review sushi and that was a really, really great time. And so I would say like the TLDR of it is I've probably been reading and writing and photographing for a really, really long time, but I never really felt comfortable enough to take the leap to do it professionally. You know, when I graduated college, it was a time when you know we've seen what's happened with the New Yorker union. We've seen what's happened in other areas of, you know, traditional journalism, where salaries were really, really low. And I came from, you know, an immigrant background, and I didn't have that financial cushion to take that leap of faith at that point in my life. Like I wanted to be independent and not, you know, add extra stress to my parents. Um, So yes, that's, that's the TLDR of it. That was my journalism experience was really rich and really fun, and really vast, but never in a professional newsroom yet, because I just couldn't see myself making that. And you went into man- management consulting, which is more lucrative, right? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I went into management consulting, which is much more, I would say, not necessarily lucrative when you're an analyst, but it's basically like an executive boot camp. You basically um, learn the ins and outs of the business world over two years in the analyst program. Um, in such a rapid succession and meeting so many different clients and so many different people and so many different working styles that it feels like you fit together like five to 10 years of 
work experience in two years. It's, it's kind of intense. So I would say like a lot of people go into consulting, not necessarily for the money. You'd be surprised by some of our earnings um, as an analyst program, frankly. Um, I think it's gotten much more competitive in recent years because of competition from tech, stealing away young talent. But at the time I was doing it, like I basically earned what you can see as the now about minimum wage for the New Yorker as a journalist. It's a very different time. I might have made a different decision. Yeah. Um, you mostly do it for, I think, like career advancement or career kind of acceleration. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people I've had on this podcast or interviewed for my newsletter and like entrepreneurs, they started out in management consulting, which kind of speaks to that, what you're talking about in terms of like management boot camp or, or how to build, like getting exposed to various aspects of a business very quickly. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh huh. And so you were born in India and moved to the U.S. when you were very young. How old were you? Three? Yeah, I was three. Yes. Uh huh. And do you feel like you belong? And this is kind of getting into you know what you did with the juggernaut. Like, do you feel like you belong to a group of Americans that hasn't really been well served by the media? Very great question. So, I think the short answer is yes, and I think the longer answer is. You know, one of the very reasons is that th this kind of generation, um, I would say growing up in the 90s in America, it wasn't as if you saw much representation and much, frankly, if that makes sense. So in, in, a, in a sense, the nuanced answer is, you know, the media wasn't really covering us because they weren't even really noticing us because we were really, really small part of the American demographic at that point. Um, very, very tiny. But we have to remember the reason we were a tiny part of the American demographic is that Asian Americans in, in general and in specific have been the most discriminated against um, group of people when it comes to U.S. immigration. And so there weren't that many of us. I, and this is a pre, um, I just have to remind folks because people take think it's a given that an Indian American will win the national spelling bee. But this was pre that time, right? This wasn't a given. And this was pre a Sachin Adela leading a Microsoft or a Sundar Pichai leading Google or Sadiq Khan becoming the mayor of London or Kamala Harris becoming our vice president. This was a time when a lot of folks were working in a space where, you know, frankly, as an immigrant kid, I mostly was trying to probably a mixture of assimilate and not really talk about it. And so a lot of my culture was taken up in spaces in private, like you know, watching tons of Bollywood movies in the weekend. And then when I'd show up to high school or middle school, I was just really just honestly trying to fit in. And I knew I didn't fit in. My fashion didn't fit in. My glasses didn't fit in. My haircuts didn't fit in. My hair didn't fit in. And so that was kind of the generation, you know, in that period. And I would say today, one of, one of the reasons the juggernaut exists is because many of those stories will never be told by mainstream media because it's just not that important to them, right? And why should it be? There's no reason other folks should care. But for our community, there's just so many spaces and conversations and topics that we just haven't even been able to discuss amongst ourselves and kind of reanalyze. I was just speaking to a lifetime subscriber today and she said, the juggernaut is, you know, the way it hooks you is a little bit with nostalgia and then educating you about that nostalgia and giving you that space to explore that nostalgia space that you might not have had before. So it's unpacking a lot of these I think older memories and conversations and allowing it to kind of fuse with the newer identities of who we are today. And, but you're also at the same time, like tapping into like a huge untapped market in the sense of like, how talk, talk about how big the market is in terms of, I think you, I think I was reading on the juggernaut, you said that like uh, Indian Americans make up like 1.6% of the population, but that, like have an incredibly incredible amount of spending power. Can you talk a little bit about that from like a demographic perspective? Yes. So in terms of South Asian Americans specifically and South Asian America is a very um, specific phrase that some people do not like, but I'll explain where it comes from. It's if you envisioned a greater subcontinent before colonial powers came and drew lines, for example. So traditionally, it also includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Nep um, uh, Bhutan, sometimes Afghanistan, sometimes Myanmar. And when you look at this entire group of people, the majority of it is Indian Americans. And they are a very interesting group of people in America. So South Asian Americans overall are the fastest growing major demographic in the US. Um, it's been pretty insane. It sometimes follows the rise of tech, but also follows the rise of illegal, illegal immigration in, uh, in the US. 
What's also interesting about this demographic is that when you specifically look at Indian Americans, which make up about 80% of this demographic, they have about $460 billion of disposable income. I'm going to repeat that again because people think I'm, you know, being insane, but it's, again, it's $460 billion of disposable income. So Indian Americans are the richest demographic in the U.S. And part of it is because we've been selected for that, right? When you think of going back to this whole immigration piece, that's We've been the most excluded when it comes to U.S. immigration. And so for a long time, you know, the U.S. was cherry picking just Indian Americans specifically or South Asian Americans who are highly, highly skilled. And when you bring that to bear, that means that Indian Americans today have 3x the median income of the average American. The median income for Indian Americans is 150K. For the median uh, income for all of the U.S. is 50K. It's a huge discrepancy. And so when you think about the size in terms of eyeballs, it wouldn't make sense to start necessarily per chance an ad based business because it's really tiny. It's like six million of us in the U.S. specifically. And by the way, that's only our first market. Our ambitions are far more global. But when you look at the kind of spending power this demographic has and is not being served, it's it just completely blows you away. And so let's talk about kind of the genesis of the juggernaut. Like you have, you originally thought of it, or maybe it wasn't even called the juggernaut at the time, but like you were thinking of kind of like a Bollywood, Bollywood version of Netflix, right? Yes. Oh my goodness. So when I was, you know, I, I'm a huge Bollywood watcher and fan. And my first iteration of, of, of a version of something that could serve our, our demographic and our audience was, You know, this was back in the 2010s, and I thought, well, why is it so hard for me to watch Bollywood on Netflix? Like, it was really, really difficult to find these films on streaming. It was so difficult. I think I would go to India and buy the DVDs back when DVDs were a thing and, like, watch it because there was no other way to find these movies. And I really, really thought that 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 was what, what, what was going to kick it off. And I remember talking to even the founders of Drama Fever, which is a very specialized streaming service for Korean dramas. And I thought, you know, I really want to build this. And maybe I was too chicken. Maybe I thought I would need more resources. And I also really thought Netflix would be far faster than it ended up being. I was like, no, this is never going to work because Netflix and, you know, Amazon, they're going to eat my lunch. It would take them, I think, six more years before they even came close to the vision I was thinking of. But it is what it is. And Instead, you know, I kind of went a different route, which eventually became the juggernaut, which we can talk about. But that was my very, very first version of what I thought um, we could build to serve this audience. And yeah, and so, so I mean, yeah, Netflix arguably waited longer than it should have, but it probably, even if you had gone on to found that, like Netflix would have caught up very quickly. And it is like, it is investing in Korean dramas, Bollywood stuff, a lot of that stuff now, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was kind of the game theory that I made as well. Um, But hey, who knows? Maybe they would have just acquired a drama fever or acquired our company. We don't know. But um, it was it was it was a good thought exercise. (laughs) And then but then it eventually you started thinking more in terms of news. I think the initial version of the juggernaut started as a free newsletter. When did you launch it? Tell me about like what your thinking was when you originally launched it. Talk about that kind of, and what year was that? Yeah, I think, you know, I also evolved as a, probably as a business thinker through my twenties and, you know, I got to kind of look at a few more companies and kind of look out into the market to see what else was going on. And I quickly realized that one of the big opportunities was journalism and media and news because so much of it had been threatened by the likes of Facebook and Google. It was just really hurting as an industry. And so, you know, when most people see lots of challenges, you know, I think there are plenty of entrepreneurs who see opportunity. And so I thought, well, what could I do here if this is a place where things aren't good enough? How do I make things better? And so the first iteration of this was a free newsletter. I wanted to test my idea, but I wanted to do it in the cheapest way possible. So I was still working at McKinsey. And what I would do is on the weekends or whenever I was, you know, free, I would just put together a newsletter for my friends on what was happening in South Asian news, but also what was happening in diaspora news, what we call like folks living outside the homeland. So people living in, you know, Canada, America, England, et cetera, but you know, who are South Asian identifying. And 
I started sending it to them. And then pretty soon they would give me a ton of feedback and start sharing it with their friends who would start sharing it with their friends. And by no means was this newsletter large at all. It was only 700 people, but it came to a point, And you know, I've spoken about this before where I didn't know more than half of the people on the list. So I thought, who are these people who are reading my newsletter? And our open rates were insane. Like they were just really, really high. And we also have to remember this was an era where people were not verticalizing news along the category of South Asians around the world, right? That is still very, very rare. If you look at The Economist, they do have a China section, but they don't have an India section, right? So this was, you know, taking cues from the likes of Bill Bishop's Sinicism. This was taking cues from the likes of a morning brew or a skim, which was like, how do we kind of test this idea with a free newsletter, get into people's inboxes and see what happens. And that kind of gave us the confidence um, to do more, which is like, with that idea, that was the idea that got us into Y Combinator. And during and so, like, yeah, go ahead. All right. Wanna, so it was yeah. like a cura- it was a curational email, like Morning Brew esque in the sense of like you weren't doing a lot of original reporting. It was just kind of like this is some stuff that's happened in South Asia, Pakistan, India, but here's what the diaspora in like the United States, UK, different stuff like that. Here's some news around that. Exactly. We just summarized uh-huh. other people's news. And then analyzed anything that was going on in terms of conversations. That was it. No what, recall reporting. And what newsletter platform were you using? We were using Mailchimp. Uh huh. And then so the the, the seven hundred signups. That's just from people like forwarding it, and then maybe you had some like kind of link within the newsletter saying here here's where you can go to sign up or something like that. Oh, I wish I was even. I wish I was more marketing oriented in that phase of my life. It was mostly <laughs> me just honestly emailing some of my close friends saying, you're about to get this. If you don't want to get it, please unsubscribe. <laughs> like I really yeah. just made it super easy for them to uh-huh. like, you know, opt in versus opt out. <laughs> and then, uh-huh. and then I would email them every few weeks. If, especially the ones who I saw were opening it a lot, like, Hey, are there three to five friends who you think would really enjoy this? I'll reach out to them myself. So I made it like so easy for them. Like it was kind of like a white glove service. That's really yeah. how I did it. Um, and in hindsight, I probably should have asked more. In hindsight, I should have been more markety. I really wasn't. I was. It was just within the network. And so eventually, you decide that you need to find investors, and we'll talk about how, like, how you did that. But first, like, what, what, what was that decision point? Where obviously, if you're thinking about investors, you're thinking about this is going to be a full time. This might be a full time thing. Talk me through that kind of decision making process that you even wanted to go and find investors. Yeah, that's a great question. I think I started thinking about what would this look like full time when people started asking me, how do you have the time to do this on the weekends? And I think there came a period in my life where I was getting more joy out of, you know, writing this newsletter on the weekends and engaging with the news and engaging with the analysis than from doing a lot of my work at the time. And I think that was a good hint for me. And it wasn't just that, but I, you know, I'm a numbers person too. So I needed the numbers to come through. And when I started seeing the open rates and started seeing the engagement levels, I thought there could be something there. And so what I did and going back to safety and risk is I kind of set it up where I felt comfortable enough that I knew I wanted to leave my current job. So I set it up. So I saved a ton of money while I was working. And I kind of set myself up with five months of runway, five to six months of runway. And I just quit, frankly, I just quit. And I told myself that during these five months, I would work really hard to make this more of a business and potentially raise money. And if I couldn't do it, if I couldn't make it into a business that was self-sufficient or raise money, then I would go back to the job market and find something else. And that was the opportunity I created for myself. And I highly, highly recommend it if it's possible to create a period like that in your life because it just forces things to I think come to the fray in a bit. And did you have ambition to do more original reporting or was that something that came later? That came much later. So okay. at that point I still was thinking, well, how do I make this a monetizable newsletter, frankly? I was thinking like, oh, can I get ads against this, etc. But then I started, you know, this is maybe sometimes a bad thing, I guess. I started talking to venture capitalists and they were literally saying, well, here's the reason we didn't back, 
you know, some of the newsletter companies, or here's why some of these newsletter companies are getting into trouble. Here are the issues with ad based companies. Here's what to think about when you're just doing something that you don't own, right? Like when you think back to Netflix, they first were an aggregator and they eventually started doing original content. And now more and more kind of distributors and platforms kind of go into original content way faster. And so when I started looking at everything that was happening and started doing more research because I had more time, you know, I started learning about companies like The Athletic. I started learning about, um, you know, companies like Axios, which shows, you know, a different model. And I think then, um, then subscription, of course, but a lot of these companies chose to go the original kind of original reporting route rather than aggregate aggregation route. Um, and I believe Morning Brew now is also starting to do original articles. It took them a bit because they were just so great at what they did as a, as an aggregator, but now they're doing that as well. And so I think in the beginning I thought, well, let's just do an aggregator play and keep to that. Um, wasn't really thinking about original content hundred percent yet. That was on my roadmap for maybe down the line, but it got accelerated by Y Combinator and talking to venture capitalists. So when people think about Y Combinator, they usually think of like tech companies, not media companies. How did you kind of decide to apply to Y Combinator? It was kind of like a last minute submission, right? So how did you end up, how did you end up going to Y Combinator? Yeah. Um, and to be very, very, clear we are a tech and media company so there is there's a little bit more going on in the background than just media and i'll explain that in a second so the way i decided to apply to y combinator is i was you know i was just talking about the company with a friend um his name is eric Lyman, and he's the co-founder of ramp which is now a unicorn it's a b2b credit card uh, it's like a b2b company that focuses on you know getting corporate cards for startups and other businesses. And he had already gone through Y Combinator. You always need one of these friends to do this, I guess. Um, and I was very lucky that I knew somebody who had gone through it. And we started talking and he was like, I really, really think you should apply to Y Combinator. I was telling him about all the terrible conversations I was having with VCs in New York who didn't believe in me. I mean, and why should they? I was a first time founder. Um, you know, I did not look like the typical mold of a founder um, in their eyes. And you know, let's be clear at the beginning, New York VCs were far more risk averse. Many of them were than Silicon Valley VCs. And so he's like, why don't you apply to Y Combinator? So I applied late. I was like, it was five days late. I was Eric, I'm applying late. He's like, it shouldn't matter. He's like, it doesn't matter. And truly, it really doesn't matter at YC to kind of do rolling. So it's definitely in your benefit to submit as early as possible. But if you are late, uh, side note, please do not not apply, do apply. I applied late, got Eric to read my application, ha ask a few friends for favors to also read the application. Um, started meeting more and more people who had done Y Combinator and they all got me really excited about the program and got excited about my idea. And the funny story, and I've said, shared this before, but the funny story was that I went off to a friend's wedding in Spain um, when interview results were out. And so I wasn't checking my work email, my fake, I guess, fake work email, my startup work email. And I was the last person to open this email that said that I actually got an interview and I was so over the moon. And then it quickly hit me that I had to somehow fly back to New York ASAP and then fly to SF and do this all while figuring out how to fly back in time for the New York city marathon. So that was a really, really crazy experience and I'm glad I went through it, but it, it was a wild ride. That's kind of how YC happened. Um, and I went and interviewed and my first interview didn't go so well. Frankly, they said, you're getting into a really, really hard space. Why are you doing this? And I was like, well, I'm not afraid of hard things. That's not really the answer they're looking for, I would say. I interviewed for the second time. And I think the second room could see how passionate I was about the idea. I literally had printouts of my MailChimp numbers with me and shared it with them. And they were kind of impressed by that. And, and by the end of the night, um, I was staying at a friend's place. I, you know, I was so nervous and I was nearly falling asleep because I was still on Eastern time and jet lag. I got the phone call and they said, Hey, we'd like to invest in you. And, so, and, and what, what year did you go to Y Combinator? I went in the, I, it's called the spring 2019 batch, which runs from January through March, 2019. Mm -hmm. And Y Combinator, I think, famously tries to pressure founders into finding co-founders. Did you have to do anything like that? Ooh. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly true, but I would say Y Combinator famously talks about the importance of having a co-founder. So they have very, very few people that they invest in that have only a single founder. 
a solo uh-huh. founder, as they call it. And I think the famous story they talk about is Dropbox, I believe. And um, they didn't pressure me, but they did point out, they were very clear and pointed out all the things I'd have to work 10x harder for because I was a solo founder. And I did look, I did ask a few friends. And, you know, what I figured was that I'd be the business person. And uh-huh. uh, I was looking for an editor to be the kind of editorial co-partner in crime and be a co-founder. And I asked a few people and, you know, maybe, maybe they regret it today, who knows, but they said no. And I get it. Like journalists have faced so many like crazy upstart media companies only for them to fail or like plummet precipitously in terms of valuation. I could see why a lot of people were scared. I do not blame them. Frankly, I'm not trying to put anyone on blast on here. That was definitely a joke. Um, but you know, it was really hard to recruit for an editorial partner in crime. People really did not want to jump, even though I think there was a lot of potential upside. And I still think there was a lot of potential upside to kind of run a newsroom on your own terms and rebuild and reimagine. And maybe I, you know, maybe I didn't look hard enough, but that did happen. And after a certain point, you can't keep looking for a co-founder when you're in the middle of a really intense accelerator program. And so I thought, well, what can I do with what little I have? And so I started kind of hiring up consultants and contractors um, to kind of build out something in three months. So what was the YAC experience like? Like, how did the product evolve during it? Yeah, I think, I think you know, it's, it's really easy to forget exactly why, what Y Combinator, going through Y Combinator is like. I would say that the most important things um, that define the program are the peer pressure, in a, I'll get to that in a second, in a good way, um, the partner kind of sessions where they talk through specific things like company culture, diversity, product sprints. And the last piece is, you know, the entire alumni network. And I'll kind of talk about all three pieces in a second. So the first piece that really drives YC is peer pressure. So you're kind of put into this group of about 10 founders. And every two weeks, you're updating the group about your progress. And if there's anything that forces you to feel accountable and make sure that you're moving along and chugging along, it's that group. Like every single two weeks, we'd be saying, hey, here's what we did. Here's what we didn't do. And if we didn't do something, the partners would ask, why didn't you do it? And it was also a good opportunity to kind of crowdsource ideas whenever you were stuck on a problem. It was brilliant. Um, kudos to YC for coming up with that structure. It seems really, really simple. It's much harder to pull off in a positive and safe environment way. So everyone feels, you know, safe, I would say. The second part is partner sessions. So every few weeks we would have the partners and guests come in to talk about very, very specific problems. And those were incredible. Like we heard from Airbnb founders. We heard from Ginkgo Bioworks founders. We heard from Mixed Panel founders, Suhail. Like we heard from all these kind of legends from YC talk about their companies and their startups. We, I think we even got to meet Jessica, um, Jessica Livingston and uh, Paul Graham and hear, hear them talk about what it's like. And they are legends for a reason. And they, and that was pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. And I think the last part I would say is um, the entire alumni network. When it comes to, we have access to this community called Bookface. You might've heard a lot of stuff going on in Bookface recently, but it's really a place where people can find and seek help. And oh, when I was fundraising, um, fellow, you know, alumni actually helped me think through the fundraising process, think through who to talk to when it came to investors. Some of them ended up investing in me and it's just an incredible community. So I think those are the three elements that really made it. And for a person who looks like me and was chasing a vision like I was, I was really, really excited, you know, frankly, that someone took a bet on me and that was why Combinator. And how did the product look different from at the end than it did from the beginning? It looks so different. I think in the beginning, in the beginning, we were, we were frankly, I would say, I, it's so funny to look back at that first newsletter I ever sent. It's like not even formatted that well. It just, it's so janky in a great way. Like, don't let janky stop you from doing stuff. Just do it. Um, so during the program, we started really like growth is really, really important at YC progress. So initially we were just kept on trying to get the newsletter to grow and we weren't doing any paid ads. We weren't doing anything. It was all organic. And it was freaking stressful. Like we couldn't figure it out. We would email YC alums. We would email like other people. We would, you know, we did all these things. And then somewhere along, you know, 
doing all that growth for the newsletter, it kind of hit me, which was, well, why are people going to go for the summary of stuff if they don't even, if we don't even really have a brand in terms of brand awareness of what we stand for or how we, how we think about news. And so I had this crazy idea based on talking to folks at The Athletic. Well, what if we start doing original reporting? That was later on in my roadmap. What if we do it now during YC? And so over the course of three weeks, I somehow convinced the engineer to build an MVP website for us, completely custom with Stripe and everything, integrated with MailChimp. And we hired a few incredible writers um, as contractors and kind of had their brands help us grow in awareness. And that's when we really started to see change. Um, we started YC with no kind of official product or tech at all, no revenue, just kind of a MailChimp list. By the end of it, we had a newsletter going, we had paying subscribers, which is insane. This is like pre Substack being a huge thing, by the way. Um, we had like more brand recognition. We had people who were clamoring to write for us. We had finished our branding with this really cool agency that did it really fast for us. We had new like HTML coded like uh, MailChimp templates. It, it just felt more like a business by the time we finished. Um, we had a new name as well. So those were kind of all the changes we went through, if not more. And, and when did you decide to make it like a hundred percent paid product, like a, everything behind a paywall? Yes. So that was, we launched February 15, 2019 with our paywall product. Um, to this day, we still provide our newsletter for free. So not everything is behind the paywall, but yes, it was February, 19, uh, February 15, 2019. So that was while, while you were at YC. While we were at YC. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And at the end of it, uh, at the end of YC, were you able to find any additional investors? Yes. So YC is really geared, also geared at not only helping you grow your company and grow your vision, but also to help you find investors by the end of it. And so they have this huge you know, program that many people know of called Demo Day, where you just present for two minutes and talk about the progress you've made. And it's it's supposed to be kind of like a teaser to get other investors to talk to you and have you close. And so they do help you fundraise in that way. So we raised a small round right after YC closed. It was still super hard to raise. I, I was very new to fundraising. There's part of that. I, I think I was very, very bad at creating fake hype, which I think other folks are really, really good at. And, you know, I think a lot of people didn't really understand what a cons the power of a consumer subscription company this was, I think, several years before you see the crazy valuations of companies like Calm or Headspace or Noom or even Peloton, right? And I think that this was just so early that people, people were in love with and are still in love with B2B SaaS, which is, you know, subscription companies sold to businesses and people are still uncomfortable with consumer subscription. That was my takeaway. And so you have this... You, you have this 100% paid product and you basically decide there's not going to be any advertising. Why do you, in, I feel like we're seeing a lot of these like new startups, like the information, the athletic Substack. they just kind of like put in kind of like their founding statement that they're not going to have advertising. And, and I guess like there's a little bit of pushback that's emerging. Like why close yourself off to that idea completely? Did you, is that what you kind of decided to do? Yeah. And I think, um, to explain that decision a little bit further, now that I have a little bit more, you know, behind the scenes experience, I think a lot of the reasons companies do this, Netflix did this as well, right? No ads, we're going to just be pure binging content with subscription and Hulu chose a different path. And I think some companies do this because it can lead potentially to operational excellence and alignment of values, right? It's so much harder to have one part of the team trying to sell ads and one part of the team trying to get quality editorial content and optimizing for subscriptions. They sometimes do not operate well, when, especially when you're a startup and have limited, limited, limited resources, like truly limited resources. So I think what a lot of people have started doing, and you're seeing this with Netflix too, is first, how do we optimize this one business model to the nth degree, right? Even Netflix is now saying they might now show ads and then introduce a second business line. For everything they say, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the information or the athletic or Substack even one day down the line introduce ads. But before they do, they're probably going to optimize the heck 
out of their current um, subscription acquisition strategy or subscription you know, retention strategy. Same thing for us. We don't have the resources right now to possibly run an ad sales team and also run a subscription team and also run an editorial team. It's just too, too few people and too much to do. And we still haven't optimized a lot of, of our subscription um, business. And so when that, I think when that comes to bear, I think that's what happens. That said, you know, I am too much of a pragmatist. I would never say we'll never, ever, ever do ads. But I, what I can say is it's probably going to come later in a business tr- business's trajectory based on how people, how comfortable people feel in, in kind of mastering at least one of the business lines. And you still have like the free newsletter going, right? Like the few, the curational newsletter, you kind of reference that. Exactly. So we have a few ways to make our product porous. One is we have great social media on Instagram. So people can preview a lot of our brand and our content without, you know, they don't, they can't read the entire article, but they can preview it. Second is we have our free newsletter where people can read our analysis, our voice, our style, hopefully see value in it. And the third thing we do is that we have a really cool feature that we stole from the information that the New York Times itself has also just recently launched, where any person can gift an article to anybody else for free. And sometimes what we do is we go to the main Juggernaut account and you know just gift an article for free for all entire audience, aka make it open for them to read. They just have to enter their email address. So mm-hmm. there are a few ways for us to kind of increase trial ability. And the the email though is still curational, like it's curating like outside news sources, like it did before. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. Well, it seems like the, I mean, obviously, you, like you said, you don't have the resources to focus on that. But that seems like if you were to introduce advertising, the free newsletter seems like the obvious vehicle to do it. I'm guessing. That's a hundred percent right. In fact, people don't know this. We did do a free. We did do a test, um, and it seemed to be effective. So. If I had, I think, 10 more hours a day, I think we'd go chase that too. <laughs> mm-hmm. So one of the challenges of a hard paywall is it can be difficult to market. That's why a lot of publications choose either the media, the uh, the metered paywall or some kind of freemium thing where they have some stuff in front of the paywall and stuff behind the paywall. And you were just starting out, didn't have a ton of funding or brand recognition. Like, how did you grow your audience with such a restrictive paywall? I'm guessing one of your answers is you you still had this free newsletter, which could like create like a top of the funnel. But what are some of the other ways that you, because it's hard to get people to, to I'm sure you've, you, yeah, I'm lecturing you who probably knows this more than anyone. It's very hard to get someone to take out their credit card and pay for content, especially if they haven't been able to sample a lot of it. So how did you, how did you get around that? restriction? Yes, I think that, you know, part of it is, there was definitely a mixture of strategies. And I basically, you know, mixed stole, you know, cobbled together stuff from some of my favorite companies. So from the athletic, I learned that um, you can hire really, really great writers who will bring their audience with you with them to you, right, based on what you can provide to them, that's different. So we started recruiting incredible writers who had inbuilt audiences who were excited to read anything they would write. And what we would bring is, okay, like what is a truly juggernaut story? What's the story they can read from this author that they can't read anywhere else, but on our website. So if you add those like two ingredients of magic together, you know, you really, really get like an extra magical experience. So that's one thing we did. So that allowed us to get more awareness from our So writers. like a, a writer who might be South Asian or something who has like 50,000 followers on Twitter, they write a feature for you and then share it to their network. So exactly. That's okay. Yeah, that's one thing we stole from The Athletic. Uh-huh. Um, the second thing we started doing was realizing that, um, you know, realizing that, you know, we could use uh, what's it called untraditional channels for journalism. So Twitter is really hard to break through, right? Especially in journalism, because everybody is on there if you're a journalist. And it's truly, truly dominated by some of the biggest, most mainstream players. If you look at Twitter trends, it's always the LA Times or BuzzFeed or the New York Times. It's rarely any other publication. So we actually did not do much on Twitter. Maybe that was a mistake, but we ended up going on Instagram before the other mainstream companies well, around the time when the mainstream companies were still experimenting with it, but weren't whole hog into it. And I, now you see like all these mainstream companies into TikTok and Instagram. But back then we really, really invested in Instagram and Facebook because we're like, well, nobody else is here or is here as, as seriously as we can be. And so we invested hard there and we did a mix of trying to test different visual stuff 
trying to test different headlines, trying to test different like captions. And trust me, our early, early Instagram, if you ever dare to scroll down all the way down, looked ugly. It was bad. It wasn't consistent. It sucked probably, but it allowed us to, you know, start slowly gaining that traction and, and that awareness. And it was also determined by some of our writers, right? It kind of fed off of each other. So we would end up getting writers with high Instagram followings. We would then go into Instagram mode and like investing. Then we try to find other writers with high Instagram following. So it kind of like built off of each other and fed off of each other. And was that using like Lincoln bio, like it, like trying to have an arresting image, a uh, good headline within the actual image itself, and then hoping that people would then click through, through the bio, uh, to like a, a link tree in the bio and find that article and click on it or. Oh man. You see, this is, we were so basic back in the day, Simon, that we didn't even have Lincoln bio yet. We literally would update the link every single day. <laughs> Uh-huh. And then we figured it out. It was truly a trial by error process. And well, because you're only publishing one story a day, so you had the luxury that you didn't like. Like BuzzFeed's publishing so much stuff that like they really do need a link in bio uh, organizer. But you guys were able because it was a uh, only one every 24 hours. You could just switch in the link, right? Exactly. So we'd either uh-huh. switch in the link or we just kept it on our homepage because we just were like hoping people just figure it out. You just land on the homepage, you'll figure it out. So those were just really funny, um, some of the silly things we did earlier. So I think that was the second thing we did. And then on ter- in terms of that, we waited six months before turning on any form of paid advertising. But after six months, um, we did end up doing paid advertising in Facebook and Instagram. And if you know anything about this company, and many people do, one of the reasons it's such a valuable, valuable company is it's incredibly good at targeting. Incredibly, incredibly good. So we could just start doing lookalikes of, Lookalikes of folks who visit our website, lookalikes of folks who visit our Instagram profile, lookalike of folks who've actually subscribed to us. And that allowed us to grow a ton. So using our existing audience, folks who have revealed their preference of liking us already, and then how do we go ahead and find more of them? And were the Facebook ads like a generic, like sign up for this newsletter or subscribe, or you're seeing a lot of publishers like the New York Times, like actually send people to the actual articles, trusting that would put them in the funnel and convert them. Like what, what, what was the actual creative of the ad? We tried so many different things. So we definitely tried some that were direct articles. Um, we tried some, which was articles with the share link so that we could get their email address as a lead. We tried more branded ads with quotes and testimonials from our subscribers. Those, those tend to do well. We did beautiful illustrations that tried to represent our brand. We did a ton of stuff. It was just really fun to try out. And then each one, each kind of creative had different elements of you know success. And I would say that the that one of the things that we still do to this day is we definitely do a carousel of some of our articles, which does pretty well. We do individual articles and then we, we try to always mix in some fun brand stuff. So that's a lot of stuff we're doing, but I think honestly, there's so much opportunity to do even more. And so the, uh, the journalism is like, is it akin to like basically just magazine journalism? So, so new journalism, slightly first person, but report like long form reporting. Tell me about like what you were actually publishing during this time that made an impact. Yes. Um, so we, it took us a while to find our voice as well. I would say, I would say the first few months, probably inconsistent, but it was really, really important to me to do a ton of customer calls. And every single time I met with a customer and got some feedback, I would go back and figure out how to fix it. And so, you know, as we got stronger in our voice, you know, we quickly realized some basic things, right? Like the first three paragraphs have to be really strong because it's what you see before the paywall hits, for example, pretty obvious, but still like something you just have to hone in um, on and make sure you nail. Um, most of our articles, I would say are reportage. So it's reporting on interesting phenomenon that's been happening. We love having three to five sources. We think South Asian Americans are not interviewed enough or South Asians on the globe are not interviewed enough as sources. Um, sourcing is a huge problem in mainstream media. So that's one thing we changed. The second thing is we do have a lot of cultural analysis pieces that are also not, don't involve any form of, um, like primary sources. And those do really well for us too. These are like cultural takes on on things that have been going on. Um, and some examples of this is one of our reported fe- features that were that was one of the most popular articles of all of last year was an article on black and brown love, which is what happens when you have you know black and brown interracial couples. What are the stories they have? What are what are their challenges? What are 
those beautiful moments. That story did so well that I believe the BBC copied us and had a very similar article with very similar sources literally three weeks later. And that's wow. a piece, that's a piece of reportage where we go out, find these folks and really try to capture their experiences, talk to them and like capture their stories. In the second bucket of like a cultural analysis, one of the pieces um, that did really, really well is our culture editor, Iman Sheikh, who comes from BuzzFeed. She analyzed this theory of a love triangle among um, a Bollywood trio of Amita Bachchan, this big superstar, Jaya Badri, and Rika. And it was called the Silsa Love Love. Like, did they actually have a thing or did they not? And she explained what the dynamic was like. And, you know, it was such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cultural analysis. I really haven't read anything like it since. Um, so that's like kind of a second category we've done. Our former managing editor, the Vanshi Patel, she wrote a beautiful story about why specifically brown mums love Princess Diana. There's a lot in terms of the era in which they grow up, kind of their in-law dynamics. It was a fascinating, fascinating story. And I would say like the, the third kind of category we do is we also do kind of opinions, which is um, these are, you would say, more hot takes. And they tend to be very, very, very controversial. And I guess one of my friends says, like, if it's not an act, if, how do you know if it's an opinion if it doesn't create a reaction? So that's kind of like the third category, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. And I think where we have a beachhead is we're really, really strong on cultural analysis because I don't think anyone else can really beat us on that. You know, we are representing our culture. We're also diving deep into our culture. We wrote a piece on why Nigeria loves Bollywood, which was iconic. And we, we wrote a piece on, um, that was by Koye, Sarah Khan, um, wrote a beautiful piece on why South Asians love Korean dramas. We love, love, love it when, you know, cultures intersect and the West isn't involved at all. I think that those are some of our favorite things. Um, so culture is where we have a beachhead. And I think we're also expanding into other kind of sections, whether it's politics or business or tech. What about like profiles of successful South uh, you know, South Asian Americans, like the senior vice president at Netflix or, uh, you know, a up and coming politician, like, are, are you focusing a lot of your, your coverage on that? Great questions. So yes, we are. We also do profiles. That's also a very big um, section for us. Um, it's really important for us. Like we have interviewed the likes of Padma Lakshmi, Mira Nair, Amitav Kosh, um, Riz Ahmed, we like to go deep with them and try to produce a profile that no one really has read before about them. Um, because, you know, they're often popular people. A lot of people talk to them, but how do we talk to them in a way and ask them questions that they haven't really been asked before? Um, by the time we finish a profile, another person, sorry, I just have to mention, um, who's amazing. It's Rebel Gurung, who's an incredible fashion designer who has you know, addressed the likes of Kamala Harris and Purna Jagannathan in uh, Never Have I Ever. And so when we speak to these folks, we're trying to really um, you know, ask them the questions they haven't been asked. And by the end of the interview, they often observe that. They're like, wow, I've never had an interview like this. And I'm like, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that that's true because um, we want you to feel that way. We want you to feel that we can go deeper and have a better conversation or have a different conversation than what they're used to. How how much are you writing for the site personally? Oof, uh, it, it varies. For the stuff that I'm super passionate about or um, many of the profiles where I kind of go chase these people and be like, please, please, please interview with us. It's going to be great. Um, I do follow those stories. I think everybody at The Juggernaut writes, which is really funny from editors to writers. So Iman writes some of her favorite stuff. Um, you know, I write even, you know, we all kind of write, which is kind of amazing. So what was the last piece I wrote? I think one of the last pieces I wrote was about um, WhatsApp misinformation, specifically around COVID-19 among the Indian American community. And then I wrote an essay on this wonderful, wonderful actor from Pakistan called Fabad Khan, who I am deeply in love with. Um, he's amazing. My partner knows this as well. And I wrote an essay about why Bollywood loved him and also lost him because he hasn't been in a Bollywood movie for five years due to geopolitics. And so those are my favorite things to talk about culture and politics and analysis and why people, why people are really incredible. That's a person that I have chased for two years to try to get to do an interview with me. No luck yet, but one day soon.
Tell me about growth. When did you start feeling like you were getting traction and like what caused some of your spikes in attention that like where you would see kind of waves of new signups or, or subscriptions and stuff like that? Yes. Um, I think that one of the most interesting times to be a media business, and you must have heard this from a ton of other media founders and media entrepreneurs and just executives was COVID. So you have this insane time in our lives when everyone's stuck at home, they're craving different things. They're lucky enough. You know, many of us are privileged enough to be just stuck at home with lots of internet and just, we just are craving content. And that was a time when we saw tons of growth, lots of subscribers signing up, lots of subscribers trying to check us out. And they're also willing to try something different, right? Like COVID also allowed us to change our behaviors. So in 2020, we grew our subscribers by nine X. We had incredible year one retention. We became gross profitable. Um, it was an incredible time. And I think that um, a lot of the articles that resonated were articles about COVID, articles about working on the front lines, about those South Asian Americans who weren't being talked about. And a lot of our articles were also about the intersection of Black Lives Matter. Like we covered really tough topics, um, but important topics to cover, such as racism within the South Asian community, allyship within the South Asian community, um, the history of colorism, the history of racism, um, talking about what it's like to talk to your parents about anti-blackness. Um, it was a really difficult time for the community because, you know, I'm not trying to center us at all. Like this was really difficult time specifically for the black community. But I think a lot of South Asians were trying to figure out, well, how do we help? Where are we at fault? Where can we be better? And I think we were also a resource at that time to kind of push that conversation forward, to kind of push those questions forward. And to you know bring that to bear for a lot of people. How do you staff the site now? Like I, I I was looking at your masthead, it looks like there's only like maybe three or four people listed. Do you have do you rely mainly on freelancers? Currently we rely mainly on freelancers. And part of this is because, you know, going back to fundraising, like we want to grow sustainably. We didn't want to be and make that mistake of hiring, let's say, twenty or thirty people and then having to lay off. 50% of the staff. I, I mean, that's something that we've seen happen in the media industry for far too long. And that was something that I really didn't want to happen at the company. And so we're probably likely going to hire way more full-time people after a series A. So watch out for that. Um, but in the meantime, for seed financing, we are very, very careful that we want to grow sustainably. And what can you tell me about your subscriber base? Like, is it people living in cities? Or they do they tend to be younger? Like, what, what, looking at who's subscribed so far, what does that that demographic look like? It's a an, it's an incredibly diverse demographic. So we have point in time surveys that we do because we don't just so you know all these subscribers. We don't collect crazy data on you. We don't try to advertise or target you. So we don't have a lot of this data, but. What we do know is that 85% of subscribers are based in the U.S., 15% are based outside. We only market in the U.S., so these 15% are organic, and, and you know a lot of the 85% are organic too, but the 15% are completely organically find us, and those stories are incredible. It's actually 50% female, male, um, to our knowledge, based on self-reportage. We also know that 90% of our subscribers do not identify as South Asian. So it's very, very diverse. 90%. And, sorry, 90%. Sorry. 90% of our subscribers identify as South Asian and 10% oh. do not identify as South Asian. So there's okay. 10% who, you know, are of various, various different backgrounds who are culturally interested in this entire community and just learning something new and reading something different. That's what we find out when we take those customer calls. They're like, never really understood this. Never knew I could understand, like never knew I could learn something like this. So that's been really incredible to watch as well. And in terms of age, are, Facebook tells me that they are anywhere from as young as 18 to 65 plus bracket. So they're across the spectrum. Are there ways that you interact with your readership through like either online communities or in person or anything like that? Funny you mentioned that. So we um, are headquartered in New York. And so we used to host sold out community events such as the Bollywood Trivia Night, a Q&A with writer Amitabh Kosh. Um, an entire panel on South Asian food. And during COVID, we had to end all that. But we are hosting exactly one week from today, um, or we are hosting on Thursday, July 29, a happy hour for our New York City subscribers. So we really are excited to bring back in-person events, of course, in a very COVID-safe way. 
with social distancing and all those protocols. Um, and we haven't exactly figured out our online community just yet, but with the summer and with everyone trying to be in person, we're going to try to pull off some in-person events first and then revisit online community in the fall. And is the in-person stuff like, is that a money-making opportunity or is that more retention? You are asking all the right questions. So I think it, right now we are probably spending way more in events than we ever make back in revenue. Um, our intention isn't to make money just yet. It's more to kind of make the community feel that they can, you know, meet each other. But this has also been an opportunity where some of my investors are like, why can't you can just easily get sponsors for them? Like, just make that happen. And we really do want to pull off a conference as well. So stay tuned. There's just a lot to do and too few hours in the day to get them done. I, I read somewhere that you've done some experimenting on Clubhouse. I don't know if you've done the same for like Twitter spaces, but what, what did you do on like some of those live uh, conversation platforms? One of my Clubhouse collaborators is Sonal Choksi, and she works at A16Z. She is their editorial head. And we ended up becoming Clubhouse conspirator, co-conspirators because I had just joined Clubhouse very early on. And I said, Sonal, I really, really want to do a session on Bollywood. And she's like, let's do it. And so she was on the platform far longer than I. And she got together a bunch of people. And then we just started talking about it. And the room filled up really, really fast. And so we started talking, like, can this be a weekly show? And before we knew it, it had blossomed into this thing called Namaste America or Namaste World, where every single week we talk about a different, you know, show or topic important to our culture. Um, I will have to add, you know, you asked me when else did we see spikes, like when Indian matchmaking and Never Have I Ever came out last year and when Kamala Harris ran for vice presidency, those were all huge spikes in 2020 as well. And so during Clubhouse, we got to chat about a lot of those things. We got to chat about our feelings about Kamala Harris. We got to chat about, you know, Indian matchmaking. I helped invite the executive producer, Smriti Mundra, on. I invited Aparna uh, from the show on. It was just exciting to take these kind of people that you know of through shows and other mediums and bring them to audio. So that was a really, really exciting time. Are you still doing that? Unfortunately, right now, I think we're taking a summer break. <laughs> I think, I don't know if everyone's taking a summer break from Clubhouse. I think a lot more people, especially in the U.S., have been increasingly meeting in person. And so that's what you want to focus on for right that's, now. That's what we're going to focus on for right now. So, you know, most of what you do is written article content. Do you have any ambitions to move into video or podcasts or anything that's not article-based? I love that question because... I think it's very easy to see that more and more folks are just branching out into other content formats just out of need and desire for growth. I mean, we saw recent headlines that Netflix is launching a podcast division. So similarly, you know, our ambitions were always from the very beginning to be multi-format. And we started with written journalism because, you know, frankly, it was the kind of easiest to test in terms of an MVP and making sure we could figure out what was resonating and what was not. Um, arguably, some would say, well, you can do video, you can do other things. But when you think about how even Google is set up or Facebook is set up in terms of, you know, how the tech works, it's actually very, um, it's far easier to start with written content. So we are going to be expanding into video and podcasts. I'd love to say that the podcasts are coming out this year, which is what we're knock on wood, which is what we're banking on. And then in terms of video, we're also going to start with experimenting with video later in the fall. So those are our current plans. Um, we have some really exciting updates that I can't really share just yet, but when we do, I'll let you know. And it's just like, and I've seen other companies do this where they use this as their workaround of getting past their no advertising rule. Cause like they'll keep the, the article content obviously behind a paywall, but then like with the podcast that introduces an opportunity to, you know, basically diversify revenue and start introducing advertising, but just in the podcast, I think the athletic does that. Have you, do you have any thinking on that in terms of potential? Simon, I feel like you've read our vision deck or something like that, because that's exactly right. We truly believe in contextual business models. So when it comes to written journalism, you know, I'm, 
I'm a hardcore power subscriber. I subscribe to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the information, you name it, I'm subscribed. And one of my biggest frustrations with the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times is when I'm scrolling and I hit ads all the time and they're not even relevant and extremely disruptive to the reading experience. And so we kind of promised ourselves both in terms of data responsibility and also in terms of you know, user experience that we wouldn't do ads in our written subscription. Um, that just didn't seem feasible. But with podcasts, it's a whole other beast and you've kind of put your finger on it, which is some, a lot of listeners actually really enjoy those organic ads that many of the hosts say. Like, you know, we still remember the iconic Mail Kimp ad from Serial. It just became a sensation. And so we're also hoping to experiment with sponsorships or other formats um, or ad takeovers for podcasts that we can't really experiment with just yet um, with our uh, paywalls for in journalism. And free podcasts are also like a way, you know, that The Athletic and also The New York Times, they're finding that pot, like people who listen to free podcasts are more likely to become paying subscribers. It becomes yet another top of the funnel type thing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. So I, I kind of, I like I kind of allegorize it or I kind of think about it like surface area. How large is your surface area to encounter a customer? Because, you know, that's another you know phrase for top of funnel, but how wide is your funnel? And if you're only in one format, you're already limiting it to people who like reading or people who somehow, you know, are able to open up their credit card at exactly the right time to subscribe to your written paywall, you know, journalism. So it's so much easier to get people to be even aware of your brand, you know, through podcasting and through other free channels. Like we've already seen that with our free newsletter. So many more people are aware of our free newsletter than probably our paying subscribers at any point in time. It's, it's like a very well-known ratio. And you kind of develop that trust and that relationship over time. And hopefully they'll convert to something more. So earlier in the interview, you, you mentioned that you had kind of global ambitions. What are those global ambitions? Like, do you want to, like, I think now you mainly speak to the diaspora in the U S is it, is the goal to kind of launch verticals in other countries that, that cover the, the South Asian diaspora in those countries? Like, what are you thinking in terms of like global expansion? Yes. I think the word expansion in and itself, there's so many axes across which, you know, specifically media companies can expand. So I think of it in at least three ways. There's actually probably four or five. One of them is definitely geography. So right now we're, we are focused on the American market. We only advertise in the American market and 15% of our subscribers organically are outside of the U.S. And I would say that, you know, that's one way we'd love to scale, which is what, what would it look like to have a more dedicated Canadian staff? What would it look like to have a more dedicated British staff or South African or Australian um, you know, there are several, or even Middle Eastern, there are very s specific kind of, kind of, uh, I would say clusters of diaspora folks. And there are definitely many ways to make our articles and content in general, not just articles, even more specific to those groups of people. And I think the other way to think about global kind of effect is that, you know, we think as does Netflix, as South Asians within South Asia get richer, they're also going to increase their propensity to subscribe to multiple different content formats. And you can see this with Netflix's promise to gain 100 million subscribers in India. So if we could even get a chunk of those folks who are thinking, hey, this is a place where we can get some of this journalism in a way that it's harder for us to get a home because of the increasing, you know, uh, battle against press freedom, increasing kind of tamping down of press freedom in those countries, we'd like to be that, that group as well. So that's definitely geography. And I think the other way we can expand, we talked about this, is content uh, content format. The third way is through verticals in terms of subject area. We have a huge beachhead in culture. We want to go into other format, uh, sorry, other kind of subject areas such as business and tech or profiles and really kind of knock it out of the park there. Um, and so we're really excited about it because when we think about global expansion, it's yes, the typical first thing is like, okay, geographic expansion. But I actually think that it's it's a little bit of a, I think expansion should be viewed a little bit more generally because there's so much more one can do. It could even be like the last access I'll put out there is, you know, we're direct to consumer, but we've gotten a lot of interest from institutions who want to buy group subscriptions. So that's just another kind of channel altogether in a, a different beast than what you do when you get direct to consumer subscribers. 
So like hiring a like commission based sales staff to cover up it, you know, call up institutions and try to sell bulk subscriptions. Right. Or it could be somebody who's our, you know, future head of growth who handles those relationships or partnerships or a partnerships manager. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Nick, well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Oh, <laughs> so definitely check out the juggernaut. If you're completely new to us, visit try T R Y dot the juggernaut. T H E J U G G E R N A U T dot com. Check out our Instagram. It's underscore the juggernaut. It's really great as a great top of funnel for you guys to first meet us. And then we're on Twitter at be the juggernaut. I'm online, usually on Twitter under my full name, Snig the Sur, S N I G D H A S U R. If you can spell all of these things, um, congratulations, because <laughs> I just gave you guys a lot of words. All right. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Simon, for having me. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.